my first speaker here, uh, the first speaker we have is Dr. Amrith uh, Gunasakara. He's the CDFA science advisor since 2011. He came to um, CDFA from, oh, and for those of you who don't know, CDFA is California Department of Food and Agriculture. Um, he, prior to that, he was with the California Department of Public Health, so he's a very broad and integrative person. He got his PhD at UC Davis. I looked at his publications, and I interpret his research strength, and he can correct me, as an environmental soil scientist with emphasis on dynamics of chemicals in the soil, particularly fertilizers, pesticides, and soil emissions associated with climate change. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Gunasakara. Thank you, Noam, for that kind introduction. Actually, that uh, synopsis is much better than I had, so right on there. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here today. This is great. Um, I am very humbled to be amongst all these great minds here at Riverside, and this is my first time to the Riverside campus, so and you have a great facility here. Um, so uh, on, on the two large, uh, two, so, so on the, on the request to the speakers on what is out of the two pressing needs at the California Department of Food and Ag, and, and, and by the way, I have to reemphasize that we're not the USDA, we're the California version of the USDA, um, and we are a, a standalone agency. Uh, so we're a small group of 2,500 employees uh, compared to Cal EPA and the Resources Agency, which are very, very big organizations. Um, and, and the good thing about that is we can get things done in a timely manner. Um, so on the two biggest questions, I'm science advisor to secretary, and so I sat down with the secretary and I said, gosh, you know, what do you want me to talk about here? And uh, this is a great opportunity because all the issues we're dealing with today have this multidisciplinary angle. All the big issues, nitrates, uh, you know, plant uptake of nitrates, nitrates in groundwater from nitrogen fertilizers. And so I thought, the most relevant two things that would interest this group would be one, climate change, and two, pests. And on the climate change front, I'll, I'll tackle that one first. We're not talking so much about mitigation because there have been a lot of resources gone into mitigation through the Our Resources Board and AB32 and the cap and trade program and all the policy that has gone with that. But really adaptation, you know, if we are to feed the nine plus billion people by 2050, how are we going to do that with the changing climate? Uh, so let me talk a little about details on climate change and why that is such a pressing issue in the Department of Food and Ag. Uh, and then I'll also talk about some funding uh, availability. So the timing is perfect for this norm, thank you. Uh, so, we, we know that climate change is um, doing things to our environment. Uh, we are seeing temperature increases, uh, we are seeing a reduction of winter chill hours, although in Sacramento this morning it's pretty chilly. Um, we are seeing increases in CO2 concentration that's contributing to the greenhouse gas effect. We are so seeing a decline in fog. Um, and we are experiencing a historic drought. This is the fourth year of a historic drought we are going through. We have talked to um, Australia, who has been through a much longer drought than us, and looked at the strategies that they have used to uh, secure their uh, agriculture production in sort of the Murray Darling Basin. And it's taken a huge amount of resources, but with those resources came a huge amount of science uh, that went into sort of securing that region to deal with a lot of the drought issues they are dealing with. And when I talk about drought, I talk about this in the bigger perspective of precipitation. Um, I've been here since 2002 in California and I've never heard of I-5 being closed over the Tehachapi's uh, due to a mudslide. So, this is the first time that's happened. So, you know, I personally feel our climate is changing. So, um, so in, in terms of, of what we are doing in terms of adaptation, Secretary Ross in 2011 said, hey, you know, can we put together a group of scientists with a group of um, growers 
and really talk about climate change and talk about what their needs are. And so in 2012, we put a group together of scientists from all of the UCs who are working in ag and climate change. And we brought a group of growers to, we had some extension folks there as well. And we had the, had the scientists talk to the growers about the, the changes that are going on now that they are observing through their science. And we asked them two questions. We asked the growers two questions. One, what are you doing on your farm now for climate change? And two, what can we do for you? For the first question, can you guess what we got? Yeah, we got nothing. Okay, so there's not a lot of research uh, sorry, not a lot of management practices happening now on the farms in terms of climate change. The changes people are seeing at the growers tell us is, hey, you know, we deal with the change of climate every day. So they haven't seen a drastic enough change in the climate to actually think about, hey, do I need to change my management practice or not? So um, that is one thing. And the second point, uh, they were very thorough and gave us a very long list of adaptation things that we need to focus on. And uh, we have put that list into this web page that um, if you type in Climate Change Consortium and CDFA into Google or whatever browser you use, um, you'll, you'll come to this site. And we have published, um, we have published this report. Um, and the beauty of this report is it talks about sort of the vulnerabilities but towards the end, you get, you get a long list of priorities that they have identified as things we need. And these priorities are divided into four different categories, technology and innovation, planning and resource optimization, outreach and education, and finally, uh, which is probably the most important thing, research needs. Um, in the research needs, there was one example that I will talk about, and that is this one that I pulled up right here. Uh, the growers wanted to know what the economic and environmental studies of, of the cost, benefit, and risks of crop relocation are, including infrastructure consideration. So to, to make this happen, you need to bring together sort of diverse group of scientists. We need economists, we need agronomists, um, you know, we need folks who can uh, tell you what the temperature is going to be, modelers in certain regions. And so, uh, so, so, so there was this, this call for research and call for, for work that we really needed multidisciplinary teams coming together. And, and the reason I put this up here is not to just show off a report that we did, uh, but more, oh, can't cancel the tabs. But more important to show you what we fed this into. So we don't have money, particularly in the department for climate change adaptation, but that's changing. Uh, and we have fed this information that we receive from the growers into um, other state programs, statewide programs, or statewide initiatives that have dollars. And this is the California's fourth climate change assessment report. I wonder if I can just interrupt you for a moment. Sure. The lady running the video camera has asked if you could leave the microphone attached and swing this around because she has a separate microphone. Okay. No problem. Is that, is that better? Does that work for you? Okay. It's a heavy microphone. Okay. So uh, this fourth assessment um, uh, has $4.5 million in funding right now, and the economic uh, and environmental studies that I talked about, uh, we tied that directly in here. And this, I think, the proposals are due December 4th, and you will find a whole bunch of other requests for proposals on landscape management and the environment, um, including food and agriculture, in this solicitation. So, uh, you know, we are encouraging folks to look at this and apply for it, and I won't pull up all the details. It's easy to find. Um, this Google search will be uh, Fourth Climate Change Assessment California, and you'll get to this page. Now, 
The other thing I want to highlight that um, the Climate Change Consortium requested was uh, other simple technology tools like, can you give us a 21-day predictive weather forecasting tool? Uh, you know, it was just a very simple thing that a grower needed to really make sure that he's planning ahead of time uh, for his agricultural fields. Uh, and you can look through the climate change report and look at all the other initiatives um, uh, that are in there. So, uh, you know, the crop re relocation thing is pretty obvious. The, the, the study of climate analogs is pretty obvious if you are to adapt to climate change. And another big thing that came out of this uh, discussion we had um, with the secretaries on pests, as I mentioned. The, the pest populations are expect, expected to grow, and, and if they were all sitting here in the room, they would be very happy with that statement. But us who produce uh, you know, such a diversity of crops in this state you know, have to be very wary about our pests. And thank you uh, to this gentleman for making the pitch about not bringing stuff across the border because we manage the border stations, and that's one of the things we make a pitch for. So I'm glad he did it. Um, so if, if, you're, if you're talking about um, the pests, uh, you know, we need to know which pests are going to uh, become more prevalent, uh, which life cycle changes with those pests are going to change. We already know there are some modeling studies that have been done to show that this could be a potential. If there's a shift in the temperatures, you know, how does that play into the pests? and not only the pests, on those other insects that keep those pests at bay are, are, are friendly insects. And so uh, we in the department are already doing some preliminary work to try to look and see uh, what these changes might be. Uh, for example, for the oriental fruit fly, um, we know that the life cycles are getting shorter. And um, this is an interesting uh, thing that we we, we, we manage a, a pest detection program, so we have traps all over the state, and we, when we get those traps, we feed it into a database, and that bait database, until, until this last year, we have not thought about correlating that database with temperature changes or precipitation changes, and this year we're starting to do that. And that will then feed into how we prioritize our research uh, to, to address those gaps. And so, you know, the, the thing with the oriental fruit fly that we saw is for the past 20 years, we saw that the, um, the, the, year long, the cycles were getting shorter, but the last two years, they, they, have, they, have become, uh, uh, they have become shorter than ever, which meaning that the temperature and the changes in temperature have really pushed these life cycle changes where they can produce multiple times, et cetera, throughout the year. Um, so the, these, these, the, the, the pest, we don't have a specific program for the research on the pest side of things. Uh, what I encourage you all to think about is look at the specialty crop block grant program. Uh, we have a lot of specialty crops in this state, citrus being one of them, which is a, a big part of this area, and then you get your leafy greens down in Imperial, et cetera. So this area is a very rich agricultural pro uh, production state. Uh, the specialty crop block grant project process uh, program is going through a, a public hearing process right now on what they, what the scientists and the public would like as next topics. Um, and so, you know, we encourage you to reach out to them. We get $19 million for that program every year to give out in grants, uh, more than any other state because we have uh, the most specialty crops um, uh, that are produced in the nation. So. Those are the two big uh, research pieces that I wanted to talk about and the potential avenues for research funding. Thank you.